talking about uh, class stuff, right? Um, so um, that'll get everybody a chance to uh, show up. Yeah, we got a lot of people coming in now. All right, so um, uh, the um, so I moved the homework uh, 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 due date back a little bit for you. So um, uh, on uh, uh, this functions and graphs uh, one, it was supposed to be due um, uh, like last night, actually Tuesday originally, but I moved it back to tonight. Uh, most people um, have done it. And, um, but if you're still uh, finishing up questions, um, uh, so you still have to, till midnight tonight uh, to work on that one. And then we have a new homework about measuring change. That's what we were talking about um, uh, last time at the end of the class when I ran over and I kind of garbled uh, that discussion of measuring change. So I'll try to make that a little bit more uh, clear today um, um, uh, during the lecture. And, and then, uh, then we get into this really important topic, which is uh, uh, instantaneous rate of change, which is really at the heart of uh, calculus. So um, uh, that, that is another form of measuring change, um, but a little bit more sophisticated than the ones in this homework, the first uh, three methods of measuring change that we talked about uh, last time. Um, okay, so um, oh, so we got like, a lot of people logged on now. Just a reminder that the uh, and I mentioned this last time. So there's an announcement on the uh, 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 right hand side of the web assign uh, homepage about the sample test. Remember the sample test for test number one, which is. Uh, the test number one is two weeks from today. That's when it's scheduled, right? So um, the sample test is posted. And so you can start working on that. Uh, 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 remember, it's really important to go through that sample test uh, before the test. It's lengthy, however. So um, you'll, you'll need to start working on it, you know, as soon as you can. Um, some of it, some of the things on the sample test we haven't talked about yet. So parts of the sample test won't be familiar to you, but parts of it will. So the parts that are familiar, you can go ahead and start um, uh, working on. And um, uh, uh, the reason it's so important uh, uh, to uh, uh, work on that before the test is um, um, to give you a really good idea of what the test questions might look like, okay? Because they may not always exactly mimic uh, the homework questions. Um, uh, uh, especially the conceptual sort of questions or the thoughts. Well, I guess all questions are thought questions, but the, the more conceptual uh, 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 questions, not just the uh, uh, computational questions, uh, those are emphasized a lot on the test. Uh, and so uh, you wanna be prepared for that uh, before you actually uh, uh, download the test and start working on the test. So the sample test, uh, to make a long story short, there's really important, so make sure you uh, 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 work on that before the uh, uh, before the actual test. So it's posted, so you can start working on it. Eventually, I will post the answers, but um, I want to give you a chance to work on the sample test on your own first before I post the answers. Um, it's not good to have the answers in front of you while you're doing the sample test because um, you'll be tempted just to look at the answers, and um, and then that gives you a false sense of uh, uh, of uh, confidence about what you know, okay? So um, work on the test and then look at the answers, all right? That's the, uh, don't be sort of switching back and forth between the test and the answers uh, while you're working on the, while you're working on the sample test. Um, okay, so uh, enough of that. Uh, we talked about that uh, last time. Um, there were a few questions from the uh, homework. This homework that I noticed were flagged as, um, uh, uh, maybe people missing those uh, more than other questions. So uh, I wanted to look at a few of those really quickly just to go through them really fast since this is due tonight and, and try to clear up any, uh, um, you know, confusion about those questions because most of them are really pretty easy. So the uh, so there must be some just sort of confusion about um, um, uh, maybe the way the question is being asked or there's something that uh, some confusion that we can clear up really quickly about uh, one of the concepts. Um, it may be that the uh, the way the uh, answers are being graded is a little bit um, unfair. So maybe that's causing the problem to be missed uh, also. So uh, so I want to look at a couple of these. But uh, do y'all have any um, uh, do y'all have any particular questions that you want to ask immediately here uh, before I pick the ones that I want to ask? 
Um, uh, can we do question 18 and question two? I mean, question one or two. Uh, yeah, okay, so both of those are on my list, so, so that's good. All right, so so we'll look at those. Um, all right, so let me open this and um, um, let's scroll down here. Well, we don't have to scroll very far, right, to get to uh, uh, to get to question number one. Okay, and indeed that was. I thought this one was an easy question, so I'm not sure what's uh, throwing you off on this one. Saad, is there a is there just a part of that that uh, is there a part of that that's um, that's confusing in particular. Um, or whoever asked me about question number one is. Yeah, the, I try to do the domain and range, the same thing I did for the other questions, but it keeps getting me wrong. I don't know the format of the way I'm putting it or, and also. Oh yeah, the, all right. So how are you putting it in interval notation? Because it says enter your answers in. Yeah, I'll put it in interval, interval notation. Huh? Interval. Yeah, I put in an interval notation and the F and question F, I didn't really get how uh Okay, so really uh, so what did y'all what did you put for um is it Daniel that's talking or is it Saad? Yeah, um, it's Daniel. Uh, yeah, Daniel. So uh what did you put for the th this graph is really hard to read, so I can see um wh why answering questions about it is a little bit tricky because the way the grid is marked. But what did you put for domain? Uh, on a domain, I'm not sure if it is the point or is this the line is going to continue, but I put negative one and uh, negative uh, two, negative two, I think the the points right here. So I put negative two right here for the yeah, for the where it the starts, -axis. where the domain starts at negative two, right, and extends out yeah. to what'd you put on the right hand side? Uh, that's that's gonna be three, I think. Uh, well, okay, so maybe that's it. So uh, I think that it, zero is right here, right? So this is one, two, three, four. It, lo it looks like it extends to four. And on the left-hand side, it looks like it starts at, this is zero, so this will be minus one, this will be minus two. So it looks like the domain is minus two to four. You didn't put that? Uh, let me see how long. Yeah, I think minus two to four here uh, for the domain. Now, what's not clear in this graph is whether the minus two is included in the domain or whether four is included in the domain, right? Because the graph just stops abruptly there. So uh, uh, so in a way, this graph is not well drawn. Um, it, to, to indicate that minus two would be part of the domain, you would put a closed circle here just to really uh, emphasize that uh, minus two is part of the domain. And if you didn't want minus two to be part of the domain, you would put an open circle here. That's kind of the graphing convention to make it clear what's happening at the endpoints of a graph or, or, or the boundaries of a graph. So same thing over here on the right. Uh, it's not clear if a four is part of the domain or is not part of the domain. The, the domain stops at four, right? But it's not clear if that boundary value is included in the domain or not included in the domain. So I, I, I you know, I, I think we could try either way, but if we assume it's included, then it looks like the domain there is, uh, if I can uh, see if I can find my, um, so what, minus two and then comma four. I think that is the, uh, I think that's the domain. And the range then, you look at the y-axis, right? So the graph starts down here at this, I think this is minus one on the y-axis and goes up to, what is that? One, two, three, four. So also goes up to uh, four on the, oh, is that, no, that's three, right? One, two, three. So it goes up to um, um, three on the y-axis. So I think the, uh, I think the, um, uh, a range there is uh, minus one to three. So uh, minus one to uh, three. Uh, so we can check that here in a, we can check that here in a second, okay? So uh, for these first ones, uh, uh, do you understand how to calculate F of one? 
that's easy, right? You yeah, just yeah. find one yeah, on right. the X axis and then F of one would be up here, right? So I think that is three, right? Okay, um, okay. that's that turning point. And uh, uh, remember that's the turning point on the graph because that's where it switches from increasing to decreasing, right? And so uh, F of one is three. Might as well go ahead and fill these in while I'm thinking about that. And then what's F of minus one? Uh, well, here's, oh boy, I don't know what F of minus one is there, right? Okay, so it says estimate the value. Did y'all try something there? It's going to be uh, negative one over four. Uh, uh, oh, so, uh, uh, so about minus point two, you said minus point two five or something like that? Or I, I would have put minus point point zero point two and it worked. Uh, uh, yeah, I would have put something like minus 0.2. They probably give you a little leeway here, okay, in estimating that uh, value, right? Okay, there's obviously, there's minus one on the x-axis and it comes down just a little bit below zero, right? So I, I'm thinking that's about uh, uh, minus 0.2, okay? Now, here's the question that sometimes students get messed up on. For what values is, uh, uh, for what values of X is F of X equal one, right? So here we're looking for X values, not Y value, right? Okay, this is the Y value. So find one on the Y axis and then find the X values that match that, right? So there's one on the Y axis. What are the X values that match that? Well, uh, the first one is here at zero, right? Okay, see here's one on the Y axis. First X value is zero. And where's the next X value though? Over here right at, uh, is that three? Yeah, okay. So uh, there are really uh, 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 two uh, X uh, uh, values there that match uh, the output um, um, one, okay? So there are two X, X values that match a Y value of one. Now, here's the question though that is usually of most interest to us. It's not what X values match a Y value of one, but usually we're interested in what X values match a Y value of zero, because these are the X intercepts, okay? And the, we're gonna be looking for those frequently in the class. So uh, uh, so there's the, uh, uh, there's the X axis, right? Uh, 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 that's where Y is equal to zero. So Y is equal to zero along the X axis, right? And now you're gonna have to, S so right there, right, is the X value that gives you a Y value of zero. So you're gonna have to um, estimate that, okay? So see, there's a zero on the X axis. This is minus one on the X axis. So what does that look like to us? Maybe minus 0.7 or minus 0.8, something like that. You have to just eyeball it as best you, um, uh, 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 as best you can, okay? So there you might have to experiment a little bit uh, to get the, um, to get the right values. I'm gonna try minus 0.7. Uh, I put, I put a negative three over four and uh, it works, I think. It worked also? Okay, all right. So oh, yeah, uh, negative three. there you go. Negative three over four. Right, okay. Uh, let's see now. Um, uh, finally, this last one, Daniel, for you. So uh, on what interval is F increasing? Where is F increasing, right? So this is really a more calculus question for us. Where is F increasing? So as you go from left to right, Daniel, where is it increasing? Where does it start increasing? Uh, start increasing for on uh, when the y and when the x value is zero. Or uh, well, from left to right, this this whole piece is increasing, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So negative. where does that start on the x-axis? It's it's going to be negative two. Negative two, and that continues until we hit this turning point, which is at what one. One. Yeah, yeah, right. So it looks like the answer they want here is, I'm thinking, uh, minus two uh, to one. Okay, right. Um, let's see if I can find this. So uh, minus two uh, to uh, one. Did I enter that right? Yeah, let's submit that and see, um, see if I got those right. So did that work out okay? Yeah, yay. Okay, so I did that pretty good. Ooh, I got I actually have a score on the homework now. All right, so um, that's exciting, okay. Um, all right, um, all right. So that was one of the ones that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and then uh, someone else had already asked me, what about 18, okay? So 
Let's scroll down all the way down. And actually, I think this is kind of a similar question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a graph that you're uh, looking at, right? Except it's just in an applied um, example. Oh, I know what's hard about this one, okay? Um, I know what's hard about this one. Um, uh, it, it's just reading the graph is really difficult because you have, you know, uh, they don't give you a grid and uh, these uh, output values, uh, in this case, these are deaths, okay? Oh, the, okay, I didn't pick this problem for this reason. Here's another epidemic problem. This is the uh, Spanish flu epidemic, okay? Um, um, about a hundred years ago. So, um, and so this is, uh, um, uh, uh, this graph shows the death among uh, US Army members uh, just in the first three uh, months of the um, uh, flu epidemic, okay? Uh, the uh, Spanish flu epidemic, uh, which happened in World War I. Um, okay, so um, uh, so uh, th that's just the story behind the problem, but th uh, the questions here are just very mathematical. It says, use the graph to describe uh, the behavior of this uh, function, which they're calling A, right? Increasing, decreasing, or constant. That's pretty easy. So which is it there, obviously? Well, as you go from left to right, what's happening? Uh, what now? Increasing. Incre sure, it's increasing, right? Yeah, the deaths are increasing, right? Um, uh, 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 you know, people aren't coming back alive, so the deaths can't be decreasing. So, um, uh, uh, so increasing, right? And then, um, and now the harder question is the concavity question, right? So these are always harder. And um, so uh, uh, remember concavity, it, it tells us about curvature, correct? Okay, now I want you, you have to look very closely at this graph. So this is where students uh, 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 sometimes have issues, okay? So when, when you're looking at the graph here, again, going from left to right, the first piece of this graph notice is kind of bent upwards, right? That looks like an arc that's bent upwards. So on the left-hand side here, this, the curvature of this graph is concave. What direction is that? Up. Up, right. This is concave up, right. When it's bent up, I don't know if y'all can see me gesturing here, but when it looks like a straight line that's been bent up like this, right, that's concave up. If it's a straight line that's bent, that's been bent down like this, if you're thinking of grabbing and bending the graph, uh, that's concave down. So the first part is concave down, but notice when you move over to the right, it's it becomes bent down, okay, um, right, okay? And uh, 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 so that part is concave down. So there's a switch in the concavity, okay? And, uh, uh, and that's sort of the uh, point of the question here. So it's, it says the concavity appears to change from what? concave up, we just said this, right, to concave down. So now that has, that change has to occur somewhere, okay, that change has to occur somewhere, and, um, and so the, where that change occurs, that is the inflection point, okay. So remember, where the curve switches from increasing to decreasing, that's a turning point. This uh, graph has no turning points, though, because this thing is all, this, this curve is always increasing, this is not a turning point, by the way, okay? Just because you have a bend in the graph doesn't mean it's a turning point, okay? Um, uh, 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 it doesn't have any peak points or valley points. It's always increasing, so no turning points. But it does have an inflection point because it is switching from, uh, uh, from being concave up here to being concave down. Now, we're just gonna have to eyeball where that inflection point occurs, okay? So where is the actual actual switch at, okay? And I would say right here, doesn't it look like it's about right there, okay? Some people may have it a little bit further to the right. Uh, some people may have a little bit further to the left, but I'm going with right there is where I think it is, right there, okay? And so what does that look like? Uh, that's at T what? T equals six? Yeah, okay. So I'm thinking the answer here is T equals six. But, uh, but I saw the answer to this question uh, before class, and they actually estimate it at 6.2. So they're giving a very precise estimate uh, uh, for uh, uh, where that inflection point is. They think it's a little bit further to the right than six. That's very difficult to eyeball, folks, okay? That's very difficult to eyeball. So if you put six, for instance, the inflection point is at six, 
on a test, I would certainly give you credit for that. But I don't know if WebAssign is going to give you credit for that or not. We'll check it here. So it looks to me like the inflection point is about six on the T axis, the X axis, in other words, and then about 8,000 on the, on the Y axis. Um, let's check this. But again, I looked at the answers that uh, 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 the answers and it said 6.2. And again, I'm not sure how you're supposed to get an estimate that close. Okay. Let's see what, um, let's see what it, what it, does it give me a, does it give me it correct? Does it give me, any, yeah, it does. Okay. So it gave me a little bit of, uh, uh, it gave me a little bit of wiggle room there. Okay. Um, all right. I heard someone saying something. Were you asking me a question? So I was going to ask if you could do a uh, question number 12, please. Yeah. Question number 12. Yeah, that's not on my list, but uh, but we'll, we'll certainly look at that one. So um, is that sort of a similar type question or is that a computational question? Let's no, it's see. different. Uh, it's okay. part B of it that I'm not getting. All right. So um, yeah, that's an, that's an interpret, well, not an interpretation question. It's kind of the opposite of an interpretation question. It's taking a sentence and uh, putting it back into function notation. Uh, the first part is an interpretation. That's taking function notation and writing it down as a sentence, right? Remember, when we do that, that's called interpreting the notation. So whenever we have mathematical notation and we uh, convert it into words, that's called interpreting the notation. So here, you're interpreting function notation because this is function notation, right? Uh, here, we're going backwards. Um, we're taking a sentence and we're going to we're going to uh, express it in function notation. All right. Well, let's do both parts there. So uh, it just uh, it helps to do A so that we can understand B. So let me read this here. So the number you might have slightly different numbers, by the way, Lance. So uh, the number of donors uh, uh, to the American Red Cross Relief Fund uh, who donated more than X million dollars is represented by D of X. So you have to read that carefully. So this is the number of people who donated more than whatever this value X is, okay? This is uh, 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 during 2005, all right? So in 2005, so a D of nine equals nine. So that tells us in 2005, right? Uh, 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 this, is, uh, the, this nine is the input value, right? Okay, so that tells us that... Um, nine donors only, nine donors, right? Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, donated more than, and now uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the donation amount is the uh, output amount, okay? Oh, no, 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 I'm saying this wrong, all right. Uh, uh, the, um, <clears throat> The X is the uh, donation amount. So that's 9 million, okay? And then this number is the number of donors who donated more than that, right? Okay. Oh, okay. So this number also is nine. So nine donors donated more than $9 million, okay? So, wow, uh, got typing in the 9 million. Let's see. Uh, I, I got the first part right without typing yeah. in the 9 million. I just put in like... Oh, never mind, never mind, I put in. All right, now let's try going backwards though. So it says uh, um, 18 groups donated um, at least 4 million, okay? So um, um, uh, uh, so let's see, how would we, where would we put, obviously we're gonna put the 18 and the four in here, correct, right, okay? Mm -hmm. but, but remember the X, the input here, the X is the donation amount, right? So you would put the four here, Okay, and then the number of donors who donated more than that amount goes here. That's the 18. Oh, got it. I was flipping right. them around. Yeah, that, they, yeah, and they, the way that, that they're trying to fool you in this question, because they've got it worded in a really strange way, okay? Mm -hmm. But just, re, just try to reread, right? What is X? That's the dollar amount, right? Okay, that's the input. So that would go inside the parentheses. And then uh, uh, the D of X is the number of donors that would go here. Okay. Got it. Right. So in uh, in question 11, then I had gotten like the second part of part B wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And is it because like it's flipped as well? I, I wasn't thinking that because I got the the X or, or the T value correct. Yeah, so this is one that was on my list. So, uh, uh, so, so it's just the same. So, people, I think people are reading these in reverse, probably. So, let's see the amount of motor oil used during the month. Okay, right um, by this racing team is uh, G of T hundred gallons, where T is the number of months past March. All right, so. T is elapsed time here, Lance, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can think of T for time. Here it's number of months. It's not from the start of the year. It's from March. Okay. And then the output here, G of T, is the amount of motor oil they used in hundreds of gallons, right? So if G of 5 is 1350, then the uh, uh, input here is the time. Okay. And then the 1350 is the motor oil amount right yes so it would say in uh, what's five months past march is that um august yeah so in august because that's five, three plus five is eight the, uh, august is the eighth month uh, the local uh, uh, team used wow here we have to enter a number so it's not 1350 though so don't put the 1350 here because you have to multiply by 100 so you take 1350 times 100 and that's that comes out nice and a uh, number though it's just going to be 1350 okay 13.5 times 100 is 1350 yeah, 13. all right oh well okay so they didn't change the second part enough here right so, so they're saying in august uh the team used 1790 okay so uh, 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 so remember the input is the elapsed time. Well, again, uh, August is uh, five, five months past March, okay? And then here you would enter the 1790, but remember uh, this is measured in hundreds of gallons. So uh, 1790 is 17.9 uh, hundred gallons. So- Oh, got it. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, that's why I had messed up. Yeah, you have to read units of measure very carefully, and uh, you know when you're doing interpretations, uh, make sure you're reading the the units of measure right. Okay, so um, you know you're talking about hundreds or millions or thousands of things, and often our input will be elapsed time. So you have to think about you know elapsed time from when, and then is it months, years, days, whatever, right? Okay. Yes, um, Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let me look at just a couple of other ones that were on my list. We've already done uh, uh, several of these. So 17 was, is that, that's not the last part. Oh, that's this one, right? Okay, so um, I think we can easily uh, answer this one. All right, so there you've got a graph, right? Okay, so uh, uh, where is it increasing? So as we go from left to right, where is that thing, uh, where is that uh, curve increasing? Well, it's gonna start increasing on the left, right? Okay, and then it continues increasing until we hit B on the X axis, right? And so that for X values less than B, that's where it's increasing. And then it's decreasing after you get past B on the X axis, right? So it's decreasing for X values bigger than B. So they're not asking you for interval notation. They're just giving you the answers here in terms of um, an inequality. All right, now that's the easy part, okay? Uh, here's the tricky part. Uh, that's the concavity. So what's the concavity of the graph over on the left? So the first part of this graph is concave which direction? Down. Down? Yeah, someone told me that's down, right? But when you, but now it's very subtle when you get over here on the right, it's concave up very slightly, but this part is concave up. And so there's a switch from concave up to concave down. That's the inflection point. And I think they're just highlighting it to us that that inflection point is at X equals C, right? Whatever that number C is. I think right there is where the switch occurs from concave down to concave up. So that makes it easier to answer the question, right? It's concave up for X values bigger than C, is that what I said? Yeah, concave up for X values bigger than C and then concave down 
for just the opposite, right? X values less than C, okay? So looking for those inflection points is very subtle. You have to, you know, you have to really give it, you have to really squint, right? And, and, and look closely sometimes to find inflection points. But we're gonna find how to do that uh, 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 analytically with calculus, all right? I think we talked about this problem last time, uh, 15, so I don't need to talk about that one again. And um, 14, oh, I think uh, this one is, uh, is now pretty easy. Does anybody have any questions about, this one looks like number one. Does anybody have any questions about 14? Um. I actually yeah. have a question about 15, just, oh, the, uh, just the decreasing part. Uh, well, where is it decreasing? Let's see. Uh, well, uh, decreasing over here on the left, right? Okay. And then decreasing again over on the, uh, decreasing again over on the right. So, mm -hmm. you, so you've got to type in two parts, okay? You have to type in two parts here. And that's where you have to use your, uh, uh, Donna, that's where you have to use the, the palette, okay? So uh, uh, so you would start with minus infinity to, it's decreasing on the x-axis from minus infinity to wherever this turning point is. We, we thought it was at minus four last time, uh, not minus five, but minus four. So it's decreasing from minus infinity to minus four. So I can get the minus, but uh, how do I get the infinity? Is that under symbols on the palette here? Yeah, it's under symbols. Yeah, there it is. All right, so minus infinity up okay. to um, minus four, okay, right? And then, uh, uh, oh, put a, but I would put a bracket here, not a, um, I would put a bracket, not a parenthesis. I don't know if it'll count you wrong with a parenthesis, but I would put a bracket. Yeah. All right, that's the first part. And then it's decreasing again, starting about here, which is nine, and then going out to positive infinity. But so you've got two intervals, but you have to uh, combine those two intervals into one set. And you do that through a union. Uh, the way you put two sets together is through a union. Let's see, is that under? Under sets. Oh, sets, that makes sense, okay. So there's our uh, union mark, right, okay. And now from, uh, it's nine to uh, infinity. Now that's a little bit easier to type. So, um, yeah. from okay, nine that's, that's to what I got, but I'm just confused about the infinities because I, I never know if it's infinity or the exact point, but I guess I got it now. You never, oh, so this has got extra parentheses for us that we don't want. Um, oh, is that going to go away? How do I get rid of that? What did I do here? I think you should try to delete oh. both and use the button instead in the sets, instead of just try type, typing it in. Oh, instead of typing it in? Uh, there, I got it. Okay, so, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, all right, but what was your, Donna, what, what was your confusion there? Um, I was just saying it's on a web assign, it's just kind of hard to tell whether it's negative, I mean, whether it's infinity or the exact point, because they don't put the points on the end. So that's the only yeah, thing. That's right. So, yeah, I know it. So, uh, yeah, I because I, we had that problem with, um, mm -hmm. we had that problem on the first one. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah. Okay. So uh, it, I would put, I would, uh, you know, I would, it should be infinity in those cases. All right because um, they really should put points at the end to make it clear. Um, the reason I, it's a little bit more clear in number one is the graph, the, the curve doesn't extend all the way across the axes right there. Oh, did it? Oh, no, that's a, well, here they did put points on the end. So that yeah, was a little bit better. Put points, sometimes they don't, that's why yeah, it's kind I of- see, right. Well, if the graph doesn't extend all the way, uh, if the uh, curve doesn't extend all the way across the axes, probably, um, they, they mean to cut it off, right? Um, so I, th that's the best way I can yeah, that point that out. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, okay, so other questions there about, um, about this homework? So I think we clarified several things there um, uh, on this one. Um, okay.
me get my part participants list back. All right, uh, let me uh, see if I can get out of this. And um, so let me close that. Okay, that's for a little bit later. And I want to, um, I've got a, um, uh, some polling questions here just to warm us up for, uh, or just remind us of what we did last time. So these may be, these may seem kind of easy now. Um, once we, since we've done some of these problems, let me see if I can find the right poll though. So, all right, so here's the one that I um, am interested in. Okay, all right, so um, can y'all see that now? So what is a key property of functions that we study in calculus? So I remember last time we talked about key properties of functions that we studied in calculus. Um, so what's the answer to that question? Okay. Few more seconds there to um, to put in your answer. Okay, I think everybody who's going to answer it has answered there. Uh, let me share the results. And um, so, uh, uh, direction, curvature, and continuity. Actually, all of those things are things that we study in calculus. So it's hard to it's hard to miss this one. Uh, uh, it's actually all of the above, right? Uh, all of the above. Remember direction, by that I uh, uh, meant uh, uh, whether a, a curve is increasing or decreasing, right? Okay. And, uh, uh, and, uh, to, and last time we started, but today we're going to continue with actually getting a better handle on direction. We're going to try to measure, right? Uh, 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 not just discuss whether a curve is increasing or decreasing, not just discuss its direction, but actually measure that direction. How fast is it increasing or how fast is it uh, decreasing? So how, how uh, uh, fast is the function changing, all right? Uh, that's what we started last time. We're going to focus more on that today. Uh, curvature refers to concavity, so that another is, is an, another important property, and continuity, right? Remember, that was the third one. Uh, that's a little bit more subtle than direction and curvature uh, sometimes, but that's a third important property that we study in calculus. So actually, all of the all of the uh, uh, results there. Uh, um, okay, let me see if I can find. Whoops. Nope. Uh, all right. So let me try. Let me. Uh, I've got uh, another one here. Let's see if I've got the right ones. Ah, so, uh, well, uh, so this one should be pretty easy now. I'm going to show you a graph, and uh, I just, so uh, uh, all I want to know is where is it concave up, okay? So let me show you this one, and um, so I think it's one that we looked at last time. Let's see if I can get it in front here. Um, whoops. We can move our own poll screen. So if you just put something on the screen, we can move our own little poll box. Oh, so okay. All right. So um, can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So um, that one, I, we looked at this one last time, but we asked a slightly different question. So I just want to know where is that one? Where is it concave up? So just write that down first quickly. Where do y'all see that as being concave up? And then um, and then you can answer it, right? Okay, so where is that concave up? So here we are getting a, a, a variety of answers I can see, okay? And yeah, so co that concavity is always, that's always tricky.
Okay, so most people have answered. So let me uh, let me end it there. Well, uh, you can see right that. Uh, uh, we, we had uh, uh, some uh, conflict there between um, uh, uh, minus one to infinity and then from two to infinity, okay? Um, uh, so, but uh, uh, it, let's, so let's just look at it from uh, left to right here, okay? So you can see, right, that on the left-hand side, this curve is, that is concave down, right, okay? Because you have a, a, a curve that's bent down. So it's concave down on the left, and but but then by the time you get to the right, it's concave up, right? This is uh, a bowl shaped, right? So that is concave up, right? You have an arc that's uh, 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 bent upward, right? So uh, uh, so there's a switch there in the concavity, uh, uh, um, and that you really have to think about where that switch occurs in order to answer this question. Uh, correctly, right? So it was concave down, concave down, concave down, and then somewhere here it switches to uh, concave up, all right? I was thinking that that switch occurred right about here, okay? This portion is concave down, this portion is concave up, so that switch would be right about there, which would be negative one uh, on the x-axis. But some people might have thought it was zero on the x-axis is where it switched to uh, 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 concave up. I could see that also. But I thought it happened at minus one and then it continues being concave up all the way to uh, infinity there, right? So the right answer is number one. <laughs> Okay. All right. So um, if you're in the 39% uh, that got number one, that's good. Okay. Um, two to infinity is, uh, uh, that's an easy answer also to pick. Uh, uh, what's happening from two to infinity? The graph is doing what from two to infinity? It's increasing. Increasing, right. Okay. It's increasing. Okay. So if you answered two to infinity, you were thinking of where the graph is increasing. Okay. Uh, uh, but that's different from concavity, okay? Um, uh, uh, it's actually uh, concave up uh, 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 before two, right? This portion of the graph is also concave up. So it didn't start being concave up at two, it started increasing at two, but it was already concave up before two um, on the x-axis. All right, now I've got so, a really hard So negative, negative one and infinity is the right answer? Yes, number one, negative one to infinity. That's what I saw. From starting there, I think is the inflection point. Okay, that's where it changes oh, okay. concave up, uh, concave down to concave up. So inflection point at negative one two. Uh, it's two on the y axis. That's not really the important value. The important value is minus one on the x axis, right? But no. some people might have said zero is where it changes concavity. I could see that too. It's kind of hard to tell where the concavity is switching. Okay. Um, all right. One more. This one is hard. Okay, so um, let me uh, let me scroll to that. All right, I cannot see the whole thing, so I'm going to move the box around. Here's the question on this. Uh, here's the question that I have for you. All right, so there's the graph. Uh, so it's this green curve. This is the number of um, active cases of uh, coronavirus active cases. So these are people who are still infected. They haven't recovered uh, or unfortunately died, okay? Uh, they're still actively infected. Uh, and so, you know, you get this nice wiggly curve, right? Because, uh, you know, the uh, pandemic has waxed and waned, right? Over the months, right? So sometimes the number of acti active cases is um, um, more, right? Sometimes less, right? Okay. But uh, what I'm interested in is, um, it's got lots of wiggles in it here. What I'm interested in is where are the inflection points? Well, not actually where are the inflection points, but how many inflection points do you see there on that curve? So how many times does it change concavity? How many inflection points do you see? Let me, um, let me find the right... Um, let me find the right question here. I think it's this one. All right, so there are your possible answers that I've given you. Three, four, five, and six. 
All right. So um, what do you all think there? Three, four, five, and six. How many inflection points do you see? How many changes there in concavity? It's very subtle, so you're going to have to squint uh, to answer that one. And we, we may have some debate about this one. So three, four, five, or six. Y'all answering really quickly. So y'all are counting very fast there. All right. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to stop the polling there. So almost everyone has answered. So, all right. So let's end the polling there and share the results. Well, we got, see, we have a debate here. Okay. So this is what I, this is what I figured was going to happen. Right. So um, uh, several people said four, uh, several people said five, several people said six. It's almost evenly split. Uh, very few people said three. Okay. Let's see if we can, let's try this ourselves counting from uh, a left to right. Let's see if we can count. So what is the concavity over here on the far left? So what is the curvature, curvature over on the far left? Concave up. That is concave up, right? Very subtle. But that part is concave up, right? It's slightly bent upwards, right? Okay. But right here, what happens? Switches to concave. It switches, down. right? This is very subtly concave down, right? Okay. So this is a, 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 a very slightly bent downward. So you're switching from up to down. So somewhere right there is the first inflection point. So there's one, okay? So we got to one. All right, so here we're concave down, but what about this little piece right here? What's its curvature? Back to concave up. Up, just very slightly up, right? Okay, you've got just a little bit of a valley there, so it's very slightly concave up. So you switch from down to up. So there's the second inflection point. Somewhere right about there is another inflection point. Now, but what's happening right here? This is concave down again very subtle, right? Okay. This is very subtly bent downward. So from here to here, we switched concavity again. So there's the third inflection point. All right. So we're up to three. What about right here? This part is concave up again. So we see it's, this one's very clearly bent upwards, right? So we switch from down to up. Okay. Very subtly from down to up. So somewhere right there is the fourth inflection point. Now we're gonna stay concave up until, here's the good news. Notice over here, close to where we are now, the, uh, the curve is now concave down again, right? Okay, so the active cases have peaked and are going down, that's good news for us. And uh, uh, so this portion of the curve is concave down. So you switched from up to down again, somewhere right in here, okay, switched from, down uh, uh, to up. So there was the fifth inflection point. So I counted five, all right, um, inflection points. So I thought the right answer was five, okay? Well, if you said four or five or six, I think that was pretty good anyway. At least you noticed that it was switching uh, uh, concavity, right? Okay, um, there. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so much for our polling. And a little bit of a review of some of the things that we talked about last time, okay? I'm going to switch that back now. Before we take a break here, let me switch back to the, um, let me switch back to the notes. And I just want to very quickly uh, remind you of what we were talking about last time. Uh, I kind of garbled that um, last um, uh, uh, week because I was, uh, uh, last Tuesday, because I was in a little bit of a hurry. So, um, let me try to just uh, uh, refresh your memory on that and say it a little bit more clearly if I can. Let me, uh, I'm going to change the sharing here now to the, um, to the notes, if I can find the right notes there. I think it's these. Um, okay. All right. So, um, 
So last time, remember, we were uh, 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 focusing our attention just on this property of direction, right? Okay. Um, remember, direction refers to um, a, a function either increasing or decreasing, right? Okay. And of course, uh, uh, functions uh, frequently change direction, right, from increasing to decreasing or uh, vice versa. But uh, as we uh, focus our attention on direction uh, and think about it a little bit more carefully, we want to be able to uh, measure the direction um, a little bit uh, 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 better than just saying, well, a function is increasing, its direction is increasing or uh, uh, the function is decreasing, its direction is decreasing. We'd actually like to be able to describe how fast uh, uh, the function is uh, uh, increasing, how fast it's changing, or uh, vice versa, how fast uh, a function is decreasing, how uh, fast it may be changing, okay? So we'd like to be able to measure the direction or change in function outputs, all right? That's our goal. And uh, so we, we, last time we introduced these three measures that we uh, use for measuring change. By measuring, I mean atta attaching a numerical value to how fast a function is increasing, how fast it's changing, or how fast a function is decreasing, how fast it's um, changing, right? Okay. All right. Now, the most primitive way that really this is the most elementary way of measuring change is what's called the net change, okay? So here's a little, I, I added this illustration. Here's an illustration of net change, all right, okay? So um, uh, notice this function is uh, uh, wiggling here a little bit, right? As we move from X1 to X2 uh, on the um, uh, 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 Y axis, I'm sorry, on the X axis, right? As we move from X1 to X2, okay? All right, uh, but overall from X1 to X2, notice that the outputs have increased, right? Okay, so there's been a, a positive change in the uh, a positive change in the outputs as we move from X1 on the x-axis to X2 uh, on the uh, x-axis. Okay, so that change in uh, uh, in the outputs, right, as we move from a, 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 a one x value a smaller X value to a larger X value, that change is just called net change, all right? So that's just how much uh, uh, the Y values have, uh, the output values from a function have changed as you move from one point on the X axis to uh, a smaller point on the X axis to a larger point um, on the X axis, okay? And that's easy to calculate, okay? Uh, uh, what's called a, a net change, all right? Um, you simply take uh, the the uh, the output at the second uh, uh, at the larger x coordinate, uh, the larger x value, and you subtract off the output at the smaller uh, x value, right? Okay. So if you want to, you can call f of x two here. You can call that y uh, two. That's this value uh, in the picture, and then uh, this uh, uh, first uh, output value. You can call that. Uh, uh, y1 instead of f of x1, all right? Just take the difference in those two, uh, those two uh, output values, right? And that gives you uh, the net change. So the net change here is just this, uh, 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 this distance from f of x1 up to uh, f of x2, how much the y values have changed as we move from x1 to x2, okay? So see, that's just a very primitive way of measuring change, right? Okay, that's just the simplest way you could think of to, um, uh, that's just the simplest way you could think of to uh, measure a change in function outputs. Now, sometimes uh, it's convenient to take uh, that a net change and convert it to a percentage. So we call that percent change, all right? So that's just a, 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 a this is elementary process of taking a number and converting it to a percentage. Here's the formula though, for, uh, for uh, computing uh, percent change, all right? So I'm just taking the net change and I'm gonna convert it to a percentage. The way you do that is by taking the net change, dividing it by your first output value. So again, if you want to, you can call this y sub one instead of uh, f of x one. And uh, so you take that quotient and then you multiply it by 100% to convert it to a percentage, okay? So that just allows you to talk about the change in percent terms instead of uh, just in uh, raw unit terms, okay? Oh, by the way, um, I forgot to mention here, remember net change, I will often denote that by 
the Greek letter delta, you can put delta F, that's the name of the function, or you can put delta Y if you want to. That's gonna be my notation for net change. For percent change, I'm gonna use same notation. I'll use delta F or delta Y, and then I'll just put the percent mark after it, all right? Now, let me show you the problem with um, net change and percent change, okay? And why we have to uh, get a little bit more subtle um, uh, uh, measurements of change than just net change or percent change. Let me scroll down here to the, let me scroll down here to the bottom of my notes so I can, um, I'm gonna show you a, a, a little bit different picture. I can get down there fast. Okay, so um, let's look at this picture and let me show you what's the problem with net change, okay? So here we have two different functions, two different functions, okay? And um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm thinking about the, the change in uh, the, uh, these functions, right? The change in these curves as we move from X1 to X2. So what's the net change here in this function as we move from X1 to X2? Okay, well, that's easy, right? At X1, what was the Y value? It's one, right? And at X2, what's the matching Y value? That's four. So the net change was just from one to four. That's a net change of three, okay? So uh, the Y values changed by three, right? As we moved from X1 to X2, okay? Now look at this curve. Both of these curves are straight lines, so they're not complicated curves. Look at, um, look at this second curve. Uh, however, okay, the second straight line. So again, what's the net change here in this curve as we move from X1 to X2, okay? Well, at X1, you were at one, at X2, you were up here at four. So what's the net change as we move from X1 to X2? Well, it was three, right? You went from one on the Y axis to four on the Y axis. So you have a net change of three. Look, these two net changes are the same, but these two curves are not increasing uh, 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 the same way, right? Okay, this line is much steeper than this one. Okay, this line is much steeper than this one. So if you just said, well, both of these, um, both of these curves have a net change of three. So uh, these curves are changing in the same way, right? From X1 to X2, these curves are changing in the same way. That's true, right? They both have a net change of three, but this curve is going up much faster than this curve is, right? Okay, so they're not changing in the same way, okay? They both have the same net change value, but they're not changing in the same way, okay? Of course, what's the difference here? Well, you know, look, it was a much further distance from X1 to X2 on this graph than it was from X2, uh, X1 to X2 on this graph, right? Okay, so even though you had the same net change in both situations, here, that net change was occurring much more rapidly, right? Okay, it, 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 because X1 and X2 were much closer together than they were on this curve, right? Okay, so this uh, curve is, is increasing much more rapidly than this curve is, but they both have the same net change. So net change is, uh, has that flaw in it, okay, right? It really doesn't properly describe for us how uh, fast a curve is increasing or vice versa, it won't uh, help us understand how fast a curve is decreasing either, right? It's, it's not a perfect a measure of change, right? So one way we can fix that, let me scroll back up now, back to the notes. One way we can fix that now is by a, a, a third measure of change called average rate of change. So that's the third way we're gonna measure change, okay? That we uh, discussed last time. And what average rate of change tells us is how fast on average uh, 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 the Y values or the curve is going up or going down as X increases uh, uh, by one, okay? So average rate of change does give us a better idea of how fast the outputs are changing, not just how much the output changed, but how rapidly the outputs are changing, okay? Now, here's the formula for average rate of change right? So you take uh, the second output minus the first output, but here you divide it by the, uh, uh, the, the 
the difference, the distance between your two outputs. Okay, by the way, again, you can call f of x2 y2 if you want to. You can call f of x1 y1 if you want to. So notice this formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. What is that formula? We've seen that formula before. What is that formula really? Slope. That's slope, right. Okay, so <laughs> average rate of change is really just slope, all right, okay? So uh, when you compute average rate of change, you're really just computing a slope. It means the same thing uh, as slope does for, uh, uh, for lines, okay? Uh, here's my notation for average rate of change. I put delta F, which is net change, right, divided by delta X. That's the difference in the two X values, okay? All right, so net change and percent change, they help us understand how much outputs change. That's my little margin note here, okay? But average rate of change helps us better understand how fast the outputs are changing, okay? Just like, a, just like slope helps us understand how fast a line is increasing or decreasing, average rate of change helps us understand how fast a function is increasing or decreasing uh, because it's the same formula as uh, uh, the slope. All right. Okay. So, um, so we applied those. Uh, 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 we applied those uh, uh, formulas, uh, 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 those uh, change calculations to this specific example last time. So we already went over that example. So let's go to another uh, example here. Okay. All right. So, and I'm going to let y'all do uh, uh, some of this. All right. Um, this is kind of a complicated formula. All right, so, but I've done some of the computation so that you don't have to uh, grind through this formula. All right, so um, this function models the jail population, the jail population in millions. Okay, so there's a lot of people in jail in the United States. All right, so that's of course been a, a, a big controversy in the past few years, right? Um, and, um, uh, and then the input here is a uh, time, it's elapsed years after 1900. So here's this complicated formula that models this jail population uh, 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 T years after 1900. I'm not sure how uh, far this goes up. We'll look uh, in a moment here because I have a graph of this, all right? Um, all right, so here's the first thing. Uh, well, the jail population has been changing, obviously, right, okay, uh, 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 over time, all right? So first thing we want to uh, uh, calculate here is what was the net change Right. What was the net change in that jail population from 1990 to 2015? Okay. And then we just want to write down our interpretation of that number. That's pretty easy to uh, interpret. All right. So let's calculate the net change here. All right. So again, my notation for that is delta F. Right. And so what's my formula for net change? Well, I'll tell you it's, it's up there, but let me, um, let me just scribble it in for you, right? It's very easy, okay? It's just f of x2 minus f of x1. That's uh, 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 f of uh, my uh, 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 terminal year here, right? Minus f of my initial uh, year, okay? Right? Um, so this is f of, what's my x2 value? Well, that's 2015, correct? But remember, we're measuring elapsed uh, years, not calendar years. So how would I convert that to uh, elapsed years? Uh, 2015 is how many years after 1900, right? Remember, we're measuring after 1900. So what is that? 115, right? Okay. Minus um, F of, and now X1 is 1990. But remember, we're measuring that in elapsed years from 1900. So that would be F of 90. So to compute F of 115 and F of 90, you actually have to take those numbers and plug them into this formula. And so that would take a little bit of arithmetic and a calculator, right? Okay. But uh, with, the, uh, uh, with a little bit of patience, you could uh, uh, compute those values. I already calculated those values for you, though, so we wouldn't have to do all this arithmetic right now. And so here they are, okay? Uh, F of 115 is 7.41. And um, F of 90 is 4.76. So all we have to do is figure out what 7.41 minus uh, 4.76 is. And uh, can we do that? I think that's pretty easy, right?
what was uh 2.65 yeah okay oh melissa answered that oh thanks melissa so melissa is anticipating the fact that i was going to ask her a question later okay all right so thanks melissa all right um all right so it's 2.65 uh, okay here's the uh, all right so that's the net change all right so now but what is that net change telling us it's pretty easy to interpret. So what's our interpretation of that value 2.65? What is that telling us in this particular context? Melissa, can you um, can you type that out for me? Going to take a little bit of typing there. Yeah, Melissa, what does this number mean? Uh, in the context of the problem, what is the number uh, 2.65 telling us? Uh, it, yeah, it says the net change uh, is slowly rising. Um, something is slowly rising, but it's not the net change, okay? So, uh, because what are, we, uh, uh, what are we measuring in this problem, right? What, what are we looking at in this problem? Jail population, correct, okay? So, indeed, the jail population has... Uh, uh, has uh, risen you're right okay but uh, so yeah the gel population has risen and in fact by how much melissa has the gel population risen yeah 2.65 watts because there's a unit of measure here right it's millions okay so the gel population has risen by 2.65 Million. Yeah, there's a lot of people in jail. Okay, so in the United States, so uh, 2.65 uh, million. But but actually, now we have to be a little bit more careful in our interpretation. Okay, because it's over a specific time period that the jail population has risen. It was from 1990 to 2015. So in your interpretation, you have to put that in. Okay, you have to put that in. So that's really important. So, because it, 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 it's not, it doesn't always rise by 2.65 uh, million, right? It's just that on this specific time period. So from 1990 to uh, uh, 2015, um, the jail population um, the jail population uh, rose or increased, right, okay? by, and there it is, 2.65 uh, million. So there's the uh, interpretation of the net change, all right, okay? So in your interpretation, uh, the jail population, I shouldn't say rose there, let's be, uh, let, let's say increased, okay, just to keep our terminology consistent, all right? So the jail population increased by 2.65 billion, but it's important to say uh, it was from 1990 to 2015, right? Okay, when the jail population increased by 2.65 million. In different time periods, it may have increased by different amounts. In fact, I'll show you the graph of this, okay? So here's the actual graph of that ugly formula. It turns out to be a kind of a nice graph, okay? And um, you see there, uh, uh, indeed, right, um, from 1990, there's 1990 to there's 2015, you can see, right, the jail population did rise, right, okay? The jail population did increase, um, and that increase was uh, 2.65 million. Here's another bad thing about the net change also. Notice that um, uh, if you say the jail population increased by 2.65 million, you get the impression that it was always going up, right? But that's not really what happened. It was going up. And, but lately it's been going down, okay? Because there's been a, a, a lot of efforts in criminal justice reform. And so lately the jail population has been actually going down. Notice you don't really capture that idea in the net change, right? If you say, oh, it increased by 2.65 million, that's true, what you're saying is correct, but you're kind of uh, uh, missing the fact that, oh, it was increasing, but then it started to decrease here closer to um, uh, uh, 2015. Okay. Um, all right. Well, how do we convert that uh, to a percent change? That's easy to convert to a percent change. 
Remember, the percent change is just take the net change and divide that by your um, initial uh, 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 y value. You divide that by f of x1, okay? And then convert that, darn it, convert that to a uh, percentage. So let's see, what was our net change there? Our net change was 2.65. What was our initial y value? Was that the 4.76? Yeah, that's the 4.76. And then multiply that by 100%. And that will give you the percent change, okay? Uh, can someone do those uh, numbers for me? 2.65 divided by 4.76. And then that's the net change divided by, th there's that 4.76, right? That was the initial uh, jail population in uh, 1990. And then multiply it by 100%. What does that turn out to be? Sixty percent, or something like that. Someone do that for me. Um, I get fifty-five point seven percent. So approximately uh, fifty-six approximately 56%, okay? Uh, when I put that little squiggly I got, there, I mean approximately. I got that too. What? Mohammed? I got that too. Same yeah, that too? Okay, all right. So, um, yeah. So now how do we interpret that? I'm not going to write down the interpretation, okay? How do we interpret that? Well, it's very similar interpretation as net change. You would simply say from, make sure you put the time period, from 1990 to 2015, the jail population increased by, and then you would just say the percentage instead of the 2.65 uh, million, right? Okay. Now, that tells us, you know, how much the jail population increased. I want to know, though, how fast it was increasing. Okay. So what was the speed of that increase? All right. So that is average rate of change, all right? So what was the average rate of change from 1990 to 2015? All right, I'm gonna let y'all calculate this one, right? Remember the formula for average rate of change is the net change divided by the change in the X values, the input values. That's the formula for average rate of change. That's the same as slope, all right? So, all right, all right. So we're gonna take a break here for about five minutes and I'll let y'all calculate that. Okay, I've been running on here, so I will let y'all calculate that. So calculate that for me. And then we'll talk about that when we come back, all right? So I think all the, all the numbers you need there are on the, all the numbers you need there are on the screen. Let me scroll up a little bit just so you can see the graph. But the graph's not really important. You have the, values that you need there um, on the screen, okay? All right, so we'll resume at 12.50. Okay. Let me pause my recording. Okay, so I resumed there um, the recording. So let's finish talking about this average rate of change. Um, so I was going to ask who has. Someone here to help us with this. Avery, are you there? So did you calculate the um, did you calculate the average rate of change? In this case, Avery, are you in the sound of my voice? Yes, sir, we can hear you. <laughs>
Avery can hear me. All right, I don't hear Avery responding. Let me let me let me pick on somebody else that I need here. Uh, Zachary, Zachary, are you there? Did you calculate the average rate of change? Ah, Zachary. Yeah. So, did you um, were you able to to compute that? Okay, so Zachary, let's um, uh, let's just go through the let's go through the um, let's go through the formula here. All right. So the average rate of change from 1990 to uh, 2015. Okay, right. Here's the well. There's the notation for the formula. But remember what these things uh, stand for here is that delta F is the net change from. Uh, 1990 to uh, 2015, okay? And, um, or you can also think of it as um, uh, 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 F of X2 minus F of X1. So the F of, uh, the X2 here is gonna be uh, uh, the 115 and the X1, the X2 is gonna be the 115 and the X1 is gonna be the 90, okay? But we, we calculated this we calculated this net change a moment ago, uh, Zachary. Do you, do you remember what that was? We calculated that in an earlier part. Okay, so if we look up here, that net change was this. That was this that we discussed there uh, 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 at length, right? That's the, the uh, two point six five. Okay, so what we have here is two point six five. All right, divided by and then just the change in the X values from 1990 to 2015. Well, that's the change in X from uh, 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 90 to 115. That's easy to calculate. Uh, that's gonna be just 115 minus 90, okay? All right, this is X2 minus X1, which is 115 minus uh, 90, which is pretty easy, right? 115 minus 90, that's gonna be uh, am I doing that right? That's going to be 25, uh, okay? So uh, 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 so uh, just 2.65 minus, uh, uh, sorry, 2.65 divided by uh, 25. Can you calculate that for me, Zachary? Just 2.65 divided by 25, just with a calculator or something? Um, um, 9.4? 9. 9. What now? 9.4. Uh, oh, you mean 9.4 or 0.94? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so 0.94 approximately? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Remember, when I write that little wiggle, that means um, approximately. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's probably got a few other decimal places there, but I'm just rounding off to two uh, decimal places. Yeah, great. All right. So the average rate of change is, um, is 0.94. So, um, but now Zachary, here's what, what is that? So what is that 0.94 telling us though? Okay. So, you know, we can, we can apply the formula and come up with this number, but what does this number mean to us? Okay. So you remember, think of it as a slope. Okay. And, uh, and we spent, you know, a, a lot of time uh, last week or the week before talking about how you interpret a slope, right? Okay. So, so this is a slope. So um, how could we, how could we describe what that number is telling us? Remember, um, slope was the change in outputs uh, uh, when X increases by one. That was the Basic, it's the change in Y when X increases by one, or the change in, in outputs when the input increases by one. So in the context of this problem, what would that be? Isn't, the, isn't it telling us the, the, um, the increase or the rate of change between 1990 to 2015? Um, yeah, yeah it, is the, it is the rate of change from 1990 to 2015, but, but that number, so we calculated that, and that number turns out to be 0.94, 
So, uh, so I need to make my explanation a little bit more specific. So keep going. It's 0.94 per year. Yeah, Zachary. So, so Zachary, what's, what's the 0.94? What's that mean? Um, not sure. Okay. So, all right. So, so let's go back to our basic interpretation. It's the, it's the change in Y. What's the Y here? What's the, what's the uh, Y values here mean to us, Zachary? What are these numbers on the Y axis? Uh, and that the number of prisoners. In yeah, the... that's yeah, that's the jail population. Mm -hmm. So the jail population has changed. This is a positive number, though. So we could say the jail population has increased. Increased, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's start writing this down. So the jail population. The, I'm leaving a little space here, though. For there's a reason for that. So the jail population. Um, increased, this is in the past, so I can use past tense. So the jail population increased by 0.94, obviously that's not person, so that's 0.94 what? Um, is it thousands, right? It, it was millions. Millions, sorry. All right, so but like I said, there's a lot of uh, people in jail in the United States. So yeah. jail population increased by 0.94 million right? But it just didn't go up 0.94 million. It went up 0.94 million every time X increased by one. So what's the X here? What's the X values here? Um, what, the, what are these numbers? The X on? Value, the, yeah, sorry. The X value is the years. Year, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so the jail population increased by 0.94 million as the year increased by one, right? Now that's kind of an awkward thing to say. The jail population increased by 0.94 million as the year increased by one. That's not the way you would normally say that to someone. You would just say the jail population increased by 0.94 million what? On average by one, wouldn't it? Because if that's per the year. average. Per year, yeah, that's what, yeah. Whoever answered, that's what I was trying to get you to say, Zachary. Per year, right, would be, a less awkward way of saying, you wouldn't say each year. Well, you could say each year, right? But normally you would say something like per year, right? You wouldn't say as the year increased by one, you would say something like per year or each year, right? Okay. So, so now that's the start of our interpretation, but that's not complete, okay? Because it's not true in this situation, it's not true that the jail population always increased by 0.94 million per year. The increase is not steady, because if the increase were steady, what would this curve look like? Straight line. A straight line. We do not have a straight line, okay? So the first thing you're going to have to do is you, may, you have to indicate mm, that rate of increase is not steady. This is what's good about straight lines as compared to curves, okay? Right? Uh, the rate of change here is not steady. So the way we sort of indicate that is in, in, in our interpretation is we would say on average. So we kind of fudge a little bit and we say something like this, all right? Or typically you could say, all right? So, uh, 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 so uh, don't make it appear that the rate of increase is steady. If the rate of increase is steady, we would have a straight line, okay? But definitely not steady here, right? So. Uh, on average, the jail population increased by 0.94 million per year, okay? But that was over a specific time frame. What was the time frame? 1990 to, to 2015. Also have to put that into the interpretation. So from 1990 to 2015, okay? Because for different, time frame, for different time frames, the... Um, uh, the jail population increased at different rates. You can see that in the graph easily, right? Okay. Um, at first, the jail population is increasing quite rapidly, right? Okay. In the 80s and the 90s. That's because there was a crime wave in the 80s and the 90s and people were, uh, 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 you know, scared 
And so people were getting thrown into jail very uh, uh, fast, okay, in that, in those decades, all right? Uh, but then uh, uh, later, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the jail population wasn't increasing as rapidly. And in fact, lately, right, it has begun to decrease, okay? So, uh, so what's happening here is uh, uh, the increase was 0.94 uh, per million, but that was just for this time frame from 1992. Uh, Professor, yes, uh, I just want to point out something. Uh -huh. It's not, it's not 0 0.94. It's 0 0.106. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So, so Zach, your calculations were a little bit off there. 1.06? Uh, 1.0, 1.06. Uh, oh, yeah. So, z zero... 0. 0.106. Yeah, 0. 0.106? Yes. This, does, do other people agree with that? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So 0.106. All right. Now, if this uh, had, if this increase from 1990 to 2015 had been steady, had been steady, right? Okay. Instead of just what happened on average, what would the graph look like from 1992? Um, from from 90 to 115 what would the graph look like had this been steady what would this picture look like straight line a straight line right okay so if we had a steady increase we would have a straight line here okay instead of of course the curve that is what actually happened in reality um this straight line by the way that connects these two points on the curve Okay, the straight line that connects these two points on the curve, this is, has a name. This is called a secant line. So when we are calculating an average rate of change for a curve, we are uh, uh, computing the slope of a secant line. Okay, so we are sort of imagining uh, uh, if the curve were a straight line between two points instead of a curve, and then computing that slope, the slope of that secant line is the average rate of change, okay? Um, the reason I point that out is because this is a kind of a recurring theme in calculus that I've mentioned before, and that is straight lines are easy to work with, okay? Curves, not easy to work with, but straight lines are easy to work with. So often, we sort of like to imagine that our curves really are straight lines. One way of doing that is by connecting two points on a curve with a straight line, okay? So you're sort of uh, uh, reshaping the curve into a straight line. That straight line is called a secant line, okay? Um, all right, so there's our correct, uh, uh, there's our correct now uh, interpretation of um, uh, uh, that average rate of change. Let, let's let's try another one really quickly here. Okay, so what was the average rate of change from eighty to ninety, and then let's interpret that. Okay, so let me draw a picture though of that average rate of change. Okay, from eighty. So there is uh, 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 what was happening in nineteen eighty. Right, there was a little bit above two million uh, people in jail. Right. Okay, and then of course there's 1990. So when you're computing that average rate of change, what you're doing is connecting these two uh, uh, points on this curve with a straight line. Well, that curve already kind of looks like a straight line between those two points, right? So the secant line is very close uh, to the curve, but this is a curve. It's not really a straight line. So we're connecting uh, the two points on this um, uh, uh, curve with a straight line, and the average rate of change is the slope of that secant line, okay? So here's a second secant line that I've drawn here. But in this case, the secant line coincides very closely uh, with the um, uh, graph there, all right? So let's compute that, uh, uh, the slope of that secant line. Again, remember the way we denote that is delta F, or you can put delta Y there over delta X. And that is just the, the net change from 80 to 90 divided by the change in the x values. 
Well, the change in the X values is easy to calculate, right? We're going from 80 to 90. So the change in X would be 90 minus 80, right? Okay. And then what's the change in the outputs, right? That's F of 90 minus F of 80. And um, we don't have to grind through the calculations in the formula because I've already computed them for you. So this is 4.76 minus 2.34 divided by 90 minus 80 is 10, okay? So let's see, what's this? It's two something, 2.42, did I do that right? 4.76 minus 2.34, and then we're gonna divide that by 10. Well, even I can divide that by 10, that's gonna be 2.42, okay? So there's the, there is the average rate of change from um, uh, 1980 to 1990. So now again, how do we, uh, how do we uh, explain that number? How do we interpret that number on paper? So you would have to say on average, make sure you start off with on average because that rate of change is not steady. It's pretty close to steady between these two years, right? Because the curve is very close to the secant line but this is still a curve, it's not that straight line. So we have to fudge here on average, right? Okay, and then uh, if you want to, you can start with the time period from um, uh, 1980 to 1990, um, the jail population uh, increased. This is a positive number. So the jail population is increasing the jail population increased by 0.242 billion. And then make sure you say per year, right? Or each year. It didn't increase just by 2, uh, 0.242 million, right? It increased by 0.242 uh, million uh, per year. So of course, the average rate of change from uh, 1980 to 1990 is more then the average rate of change from 1990 to 2015, right? The slope of this line is steeper than the slope of this line, okay? Um, curves have different average rates of change in different places, okay? Straight lines, though, always have the same average rate of change between any two uh, x values, all right? Straight lines have the same average rate of change between any two x values because the a change is steady for straight lines, right? Okay, but for curves, you get different average rates of change from uh, between different sets of x values because curves are curves, right? Uh, the rate of change, uh, sometimes curves are increasing, sometimes curves are decreasing, sometimes curves are increasing rapidly, sometimes uh, curves are decreasing rapidly. So the average uh, 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 rate of change is uh, different for different parts of the curve. Okay, we've got one, uh, uh, five minutes here. Let's uh, uh, look at a, a little bit more abstract example. I think we have just enough time to start this and then we'll have to finish it. Um, we'll have to finish it next week, okay? So, but we can do this very simple. So uh, there's no context to this problem. No context to this problem. We're just given a function. I don't even have a graph of it. Um, it's two X squared plus three X minus one. And we want to find the average rate of change from X equal one to X equal three. This is not a linear function, right? So um, we're going to have to actually uh, grind through and do the calculations for the average rate of change. If this were a linear function, I don't know how to indicate that. Suppose that this term were missing. Okay. So don't forget that term because it's there. But if that term were missing, if you didn't have the two X squared, if you just had three X minus one, and I ask you what the average rate of change is, you could say immediately what it is. What would it be if the two X squared weren't there? If you just had the formula three X minus one, and I said, what's the average rate of change? You could just tell me what. Don't everyone answer at once, okay, all right. <laughs> All right, can you just repeat what you just asked? Yeah, uh, suppose that we're going to do this calculation if we don't, if I, if, I, if I don't run us out of time here. But um, uh, if, the, if, you if you were missing the 2x squared, if you just had the formula 3x minus 1, okay, 
right? So ignore the two X squared for a moment. And I said, oh, what's the average rate of change from one to three? You wouldn't have to do any computations. You could just immediately tell me it would be what? Two. Um, <laughs> not quite, okay. Um, if the two X squared is missing, what sort of formula do you have? If you just had the three X minus one, what sort of formula is that? What sort linear. of function is that? What linear? Linear function. function. Yeah, it's a linear function. But for linear functions, average rate of change is the same as what? Slope. Slope. What's the slope of 3x minus 1? 3. 3. 3, yeah. So you could just say, oh, I know the answer to that. The answer to that is 3. So I don't have to do uh, any uh, calculations here, okay? But uh, this is not a linear function, right? So we do have to do the calculations. All right, so let's do them really fast here. So there's my notation delta f uh, over delta x. So remember, it's going to be f of the second x minus f of the first x over the difference in your two x values, right? So here we have f of 3, x2 is 3, minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. So I have to figure out what is f of 3, and I have to figure out what is f of 1. All right, so f of 3 quickly. That would be 2 times 3 squared plus 3 times 3 minus 1. How much is that? I think that's 18 plus 9 minus 1 looks like 26. So we get 26 here minus what is f of 1. Well, that's 2 times 1 squared plus three times one minus one. So that looks like two plus three minus one, which is five. So that's five over two. So we get 21 over two, 10.5, okay? So- Four, not five, but- yeah. What now? I think it's four, not five. Um, what's four? Two plus three minus one is four. No. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so see, I was going so fast there. Thanks for catching me. Yeah, mm -hmm. be sure you watch for my mistakes here. So, oh, this comes out even nicer though, right? This is 22 over two, which is 11. Nice, okay. So there we get a nice whole number for the average rate of change, all right? So what does that tell us? Well, if this one is not so easy to interpret, but we would say on average, right, from x equal one to x equal three, right, okay, the outputs are changing by 11 whenever x increases by one, okay? So on average from x equal one to x equal three, the outputs are increasing by 11 when x increases by one, all right? Okay, um, well, now we run ourselves out of time. Notice we're coming up on this problem where we're gonna compute the average rate of change from between two X values, but now notice the second X value has a variable in it, okay? All right, so hmm, what's that gonna mean? Well, the, the meaning is, uh, the interpretation is not really useful, uh, uh, but we do wanna see how to do these calculations, all right? Um, okay, so uh, I gotta stop there. Uh, we're done for today. Remember, you've got uh, your homework due tonight, right? Okay, so uh, finish your homework and start working on the next homework. I think you can start working on that one now and, um, and, and, and be looking at the sample tests, all right? Um, so maybe, maybe I'll get to also play in the snow on Monday if it snows. So um, we'll see if that happens. That's a rare event here in Houston, but maybe it'll happen, okay? Um, all right, so uh, we're done for today. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can ask me questions now, but I'm gonna stop the uh, gonna stop the recording. so.